appeared on asylum instruments in the last couple of years. One of these improvements, namely the, the ultra-small cantilevers, is actually something that's been around in the, the R&D community for several years. In fact, uh, several of us at Asylum worked on, on these small cantilevers as graduate students at UCSB. And the other improvements are more instrumental, um, things that we've done here at Asylum in the last couple of years. But together, those things combine to give us higher resolution than we've ever seen in, in ambient AFM and air and liquid. And it's interesting because AFM, you know, I wouldn't say it's a mature technology yet, but it's getting to where sort of winning these factors of three and four is getting very difficult. And if you look at really mature microscopies like optical microscopy, you know, beating the diffraction limit by a factor of two is a big deal. Or if you go to buy a TEM, you pay a lot more for a one angstrom TEM than a three angstrom TEM. And and I don't think we're up against those hard limits just yet, but but definitely factors of ten aren't flying around for for easy picking anymore. So a quick outline, we're going to talk a little bit about how the smaller cantilevers lower a fundamental noise floor in the instrument, namely the, the thermal noise. Then we're going to talk about the instrumental improvements that, that uh, pair up with the smaller cantilevers to improve the overall instrument performance. And then a lot of the talk is just going to be application examples, so showing you data from magnetic force microscopy, nano roughness, atomic point defects, and, and a couple of molecular biology samples that, that show off this resolution. So I thought I'd start uh, with big cantilevers rather than small cantilevers. Uh, this is actually the state of cantilevers as I found them when I started in Paul Hansma's lab at UCSB in, in 1990. At that point, every graduate student was hand building your cantilevers. So uh, the Hansma recipe was to, to take a very thin wire and bend it into a V. And you can actually see that. You can see that uh, here. You glue that to a substrate, which is over on the right. and then you'd actually blow a glass balloon, just like a glass blower does, and where the balloon would burst, you'd get very thin pieces of glass. You'd take those to the evaporator, metalize them, and then glue that onto the cantilever as a mirror, and then with a mortar and pestle, you'd actually grind up diamond, sort of sort through that to find a sharp one and glue that on the end. And as you can imagine, this whole thing took uh, something on the order of a day to do, so there's some funny stories where uh, Every graduate student had their own cantilever, and of course, in the middle of the night when uh, you broke your cantilever, you often went and borrowed somebody else's, and there were a few instances where uh, you broke somebody else's, and uh, fist fights almost ensued in the morning when, when uh, someone got in and found their cantilever broken. But lucky for me, actually, uh, just the year that, that I got there, 1990, we actually were getting some prototype cantilevers from Cal Quaid's group, and uh, he was fabricating cantilevers a lot like... Uh, these top ones here out of silicon nitride. And at that point, they didn't have tips, but but the nice thing about these is they were really batch fabricated and uh, you could break them and, and just grab another one and move on. And this was really, I think, one of the important innovations that that allowed AFM to sort of make the leap to a commercial technology. You know, if we were still hand building cantilevers, uh, I don't think the, that AFM as a, as a industry would be the way it is now. But the interesting thing is really, you know, over the next, almost 20 years, the cantilever sizes didn't really change. You know, Calquate's first paper had, had 100 to 500 micron sizes, and that really remained about the same. If you look around at, at all these pictures here, you can see a lot of different species develop. You had triangular cantilevers, rectangular cantilevers, thicker silicon cantilevers for tapping mode, cantilevers with uh, nanotube tips on them, cantilevers with spheres on, on them that you can functionalize and, and do force measurements. but but fundamentally, the length scales uh, stayed about the same until recently. And what we've done and, and uh, commercialized is actually shrunk the cantilevers by about another factor of 10. And so this is a SEM image of sort of a standard tapping mode cantilever on the right. It's about uh, 150 microns long. And one of the new small cantilevers that we can actually use in, in our newest instrument, the Cypher, and you can see that the cantilever is, is about 10 microns long. And in fact, the, the short cantilever is about the size that, that the tip of the uh, sort of traditional cantilever is. And so why is smaller better? Um, so it ends up, if you do a pretty decent job building your AFM, one of the fundamental noise sources that you run into is actually the Brownian or the, the thermal motion of the cantilever. And sort of a simple model that actually works incredibly well, really, for, for predicting what's happening in terms of the physics is, is just to think of a mass on a spring that's in a box. And 
and there's molecules running around in that box at room temperature. They could be air molecules or they could be, uh, be water molecules. And uh, those things run into the cantilever and, and we actually see that and we can, we can measure that. And in a lot of instances, that's actually the dominant noise source in your, your cantilever detection rather than an instrumental noise sources like electronics or, or laser noise. And what I'm gonna show you today is that, that once you're stuck in an environment, so for example, if you wanna make a measurement in water, really the only way to significantly decrease this noise is to make the cantilever smaller. Now, interestingly, when, when a lot of people talk about thermal noise in the cantilever, they start with something called the equal partition theorem. And if you look at that, it's actually a pretty simple theorem. It just says that, that if you have a, a simple spring, you end up with a half kT of energy in, in the spring. And so this equation here on the left, we actually see the energy in the spring, which is one half kx squared, or, or z squared in this case, since we're gonna think of a spring moving vertically. And on the right is a half kT. So this is all a constant at room temperature. And, and on the left, you have the spring constant of the cantilever and basically the motion of the cantilever squared. Now, if you just sort of simplistically think about this and you solve for both the z noise and the force noise, you get these very simple expressions that, that uh, really only have one free parameter in them, the spring constant. And so if you just take the equal partition theorem at face value, you might say that, you know, if I wanna make the cantilever as quiet as possible in terms of noise, if I want it bouncing around the fewest number of picometers, what I should do is make the spring constant very big and that will make this number small. And conversely, if I'm interested in force measurements, I should make the spring constant small. And so if you believe that, you know, there's nothing about the size in there. There's nothing, nothing about the damping. It would seem to say that the spring constant's the only experimental knob that you can twiddle, but, but it ends up that that's not the entire story. And so sort of a simple thought experiment to, to convince you that the environment and the damping does matter is, is let's just go back to that box uh, full of molecules with, with a spring in it. And on the left, I've got a lot of molecules and on the right, I've got a few. Um, so the box on the left could be, air at, at standard pressure and on the right we pump some of those things out and these things are all streaming around running into the cantilever and let's say that these things you know import a, impart a few piconewtons of force when they hit the spring so one thing we can do is we can pick out a molecule these ones i've colored green and that the arrows are pointing at and let's call that our signal you know at this scale signal and noise is sort of arbitrary and so let's say that we want to be able to measure the force of one molecule running into the running into the cantilever, well, it's clear that the situation on the left is gonna be noisier, right? This guy has to compete with 59 other molecules in that case. On the right, he's only competing with, with nine other molecules. So your signal noise on the left should be one part in 60. On the right, it's one part in 10. But the spring constant in, in this example, I've left the same. And so here's something where we can see that the, the environment and the damping are playing a role in signal and noise, but the equal partition didn't really speak to that. Um, and so the question is, is what are we missing? And so the way to resolve this, I'm not saying the equal partition theorem is wrong, it's definitely not, but, but what's important to understand is that the equal partition theorem speaks to the output of the cantilever. The, the cantilever you can think of as a transducer, right? It'll take a force as an input and it'll bend in response to that and, and its output is deflection. So, so force in and meters out. And what the equal partition theorem speaks to is what the output motion of the cantilever is. And so to understand this a little better, um, on the right, I've got a graph that sort of shows the, the flow of, of forces at the top, passing through a transfer function for the cantilever in the middle, and finally giving you the, the output of the cantilever, the motion in, in meters at the bottom. And when you work through all this, it ends up that the shape of this transfer function matters because what eco partition theorem says is that when we get to the output of the cantilever, you know, if I haven't played with the spring constant, then I have to end up with a half kT. And so what I've done here is I've, I've put a few different transfer functions in the middle here to, to illustrate what happens when you make the cantilever smaller. And so in red, green, and blue, we've got three different cantilevers at three different resonant frequencies. Green goes up by a factor of two, blue goes up by a factor of four, and let's just think about the flow of the thermal noise for a moment. So by the time I get to this bottom graph, the area under this graph has to be the same and it has to give me a half kT. 
Well, if you look at the blue curve here, you can see that, that it covers a lot more area in the transfer function. So consequently, the thermal noise on the input side has to be smaller. And so up here in the, in the thermal noise, the, I've made the blue noise smaller to reflect that. For the red cantilever, with the lower resonant frequency, in the transfer function, it's got less area, so you have to actually turn up the, the thermal noise, the, the input noise, to get the equal partition theorem to work. And what really matters here is not what's going on on the output side. What matters is your force competing with this thermal excitation. And so I've drawn your force here. And you know, the important thing to understand here is the cantilever is an equal opportunity amplifier. So it really doesn't know the difference between signal and noise both these things will take a ride on the same transfer function. And so in terms of determining what forces you can resolve or say how soft you can, top, you can tap on a sample, what you want to do is compare your force to the equivalent input force. And what this shows you is the input force does depend on the cantilever size because as the cantilevers get smaller, these resonant frequencies increase. And if I had curves on here with different quality factors, the shape of the peak would also change. It would depend on that. So if you work through all this sort of using the equal partition theorem backwards, it all works out. And it ends up that your force noise at the input, you can write down this expression that depends on the spring constant, the Q, and the omega naught. And, and everything sort of works out. But it ends up there's, there's a more direct way to do that, and that's something called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Um, and so here, this top equation is just the, uh, the differential equation describing the cantilever, and it's actually pretty simple. This is just Newton's law. This is just F equals MA. So on the left side, we have forces, the, the force due to the bending of the cantilever, and also the damping force, which is just a drag coefficient times the velocity. And on the right, we have MA, right, just mass times acceleration. And the nice thing about the fluctuation dissipation theorem is that any time you can cast a problem as, as an impedance problem, you can immediately write down what those input forces are. And for mechanical things, it ends up that, that an impedance is a force divided by a velocity. And, and so you can see the velocity term in this equation has the, the B on it. And so when we divide out the velocity, we're just left with B. And once you have the impedance, what you do is you take the real part of it. And it ends up that both this term, the, the spring constant term, and the acceleration term end up being imaginary. And so we can immediately write down the, the force noise at the input, and it's just the square root of 4 kBT times this drag coefficient. And you know, if you do the math, you get the same answer that, that I got from the equal partition theorem, but, but the physics is a lot more clear looking at it this way, because this says, you know, if you just imagine pushing the cantilever through the liquid at, at some velocity, the B tells you, you how big the drag force is. And you know, if I have a big object moving through liquid and a small object, the small object has a smaller drag coefficient because the total number of newtons on the small object is going to be smaller. And so this sort of directly gets at the physics. You don't get stuck in these circles sort of thinking about k, q, and omega naught. And, and you know, once you see this, it's fairly obvious that as you make the cantilever smaller, the drag coefficient gets smaller, and therefore the cantilever should get less noisy. So it leads to the same conclusion, but, but more directly. And it's also got a nice analogy to Johnson noise. For those of you that, that do electronics, if you have an electrical impedance problem, then the real part of that impedance is the resistance, and you get exactly the same expression for the, the input noise. But let's actually take a look at this in real life. So even if you didn't you know, understand all the physics there, one thing we can do is just take, take a, a three different cantilevers at three different sizes and, and look at what the, the thermal noise looks like. And so here I've actually got three cantilevers that are very similar in spring constant. If you look, the spring constant, all, all these is right around four newtons per meter. And the one on the left is sort of a traditional uh, sort of weaker tapping mode cantilever. So this would often be used for something like MFM. In liquid, it's useful for, for high resolution tapping mode imaging. And in the middle, we've got what I call these sort of middle size cantilevers. It's about 40 microns long, an arrow UHF. And on the right, we've got a very small cantilever. This is just five by, five by 10 microns long. And if you look, you can see that the cues also stay about the same. They're on the order of four or five. This is all measured in liquid, but the resonant frequencies change a lot. We go from 40 kilohertz to 400 kilohertz to over a megahertz as we go from the biggest to the smallest. And if I turn the laser on, you can see the size of the laser spot. And it's something we're not going to talk about today, but it ends up that 
that filling the cantilever with the laser spot is is important for maximizing your signal and noise. And so Cypher, our newest AFM, has a couple different laser spots that, that you can put in. And so you can see that this middle cantilever, the, the cantilever is nicely filled. And it's hard to see here, but the small cantilever is also nicely filled. And so what we can do with these three different cantilevers is simply take a look at what the thermal noise looks like. And let's take a look in air first. Um, so in green is the, the longest cantilever, the blue is the, the middle cantilever, and the black is the smallest cantilever. And you can see the resonant frequency is changing a lot. These other peaks in, in green are actually higher resonances on the, on the long cantilever. But the important thing you can see is that the thermal noise is decreasing here, you know, from red to blue to black. And what I've also done is I've gone back and, and used the equipartition theorem and or you know, equivalently the, the fluctuation dissipation theorem and I've written down what the equivalent force noise on the input is in these three cantilevers. And you can see, you know, in air, actually, the, the force limits are very small, which is one of the reasons that tapping mode works so well. But still, going from the, the big cantilever, I have a, almost a piconewton of input noise. And I can get down to, to about a quarter of a piconewton for, for the smallest cantilever. So there's a factor of three or four in, in improvement. If I do the same thing in water, the, the immediate feature that jumps out at you is that because of the damping, the, uh, the peaks are a lot broader, but you sort of see the same trends here, right? The, the long cantilever here is, is all the way down at, at something like 30 or 40 kilohertz, 40 kilohertz, and, and the shorter cantilevers have much higher resonant frequencies, and they also have much lower thermal noise. And again, if I go back and sort of figure out what the equivalent input noise is for that long cantilever, it's 10 piconewtons, but for the shortest cantilever, it's down at, at 2.4 piconewtons. So again, about a factor of four improvement in thermal noise. And so these things actually, these smaller cantilevers improve uh, tapping mode in liquid or AC mode in liquid quite a bit. I, I showed you from, from the graphs and gave you the theory to, to show that these things have three to five times less thermal noise than traditional cantilevers. And the important thing is this allows you to run with much smaller amplitudes than, than you could traditionally. A lot of the data I'm going to show you is, is taken with amplitudes that are on the order of angstroms. Um, the, the next point is just sort of a simple one, but it's very important, which is that you know, traditional tapping and liquid levers had, had a, resonant, a resonant frequency in water as low as 7 kilohertz. And, and really, if you want to image at a reasonable speed in AFM, you need to get uh, a few pixels per millisecond. You know, if you just think about a one hertz image that's 512 by 512, that's that's a thousand pixels per second, and uh, that seven kilohertz resonant frequency is pretty low because for for tapping mode and liquid, what you want to be doing is measuring the amplitude and the phase of the cantilever. But if you've only got seven oscillations per millisecond, that's not a lot of cycles to measure that amplitude and that phase. And so, with these new cantilevers. The, the resonant frequencies pop up to 30 kilohertz to as high as a megahertz, and, and that makes everything faster and, and just work better. Um, another point is that tapping in liquid is inherently insensitive to cantilever drift because you're basically measuring the amplitude of the cantilever rather than the deflection. So at a rate equal to whatever the resonant frequency is, you're actually you know, measuring the top of the cycle and the bottom of the cycle, and so if the cantilever is bending due to due to drift in the system or your lever detection is drifting at all, you're not sensitive to that. In quasi-static modes like contact mode and, and force curve imaging, you are sensitive to that and you can try and come up with techniques that, that compensate for that set point drift, but those things are, are uh, they don't always work all that well and you often find yourself sort of chasing after that set point. And another important point is that these smaller, stiffer cantilevers have quality factors from three to 10 and most traditional tapping and liquid cantilevers were down at about a Q of one. And, and when you go through the, the tapping physics, which we're not going to do, it ends up that quality factor is important for determining how lightly you can tap on a sample. And with these quality factors jumping back up well above one, it actually brings a lot of lower force benefits, again, compared to quasi-static techniques like contact mode and force curves. So next we're going to move on and take a little look at instrumental noise because uh, if we made the cantilever quieter, then uh, we want to make some other parts of the instrument quieter to make sure that we can take full advantage of that. And I want to show you that, that Cypher, which is our, our newest AFM, is, is the quietest AFM on the market by several different measures. And here's sort of some 
relevant noise specs on Cypher. So in the last several years, you know, one trend that has happened is that almost all R&D AFMs are going to, to closed loop behavior in X and Y. And there's a lot of reasons that, that this is a good thing. Um, one of the big ones is that, uh, is that with a closed loop system, you can actually zoom uh, in a reasonable fashion. With open loop systems, zooming in was very hard. You'd go to zoom in on an object and you'd miss it. And so ideally, we'd like to run closed loop all the time, but your closed loop is only as quiet as the sensors that are measuring that position. And in Cypher, in all three axes, X, Y, and Z, we've gotten the noise down to about a half an angstrom, and that's uh, average deviation in a, in a 0.1 to 1 kilohertz bandwidth. And this makes a big difference. It sort of means that you can do molecular biology in closed loop without, without much in the way of noise compromises. For some of the atomic stuff I'm going to show you today, it, it ends up that even that isn't quiet enough. And so our open loop noise in Cypher is down below 10 picometers in all three axes. It's less than 8 in X and Y and less than 4 in Z. And those numbers are actually pretty easily achievable with something like a 1 micron scanner. But the nice thing on Cypher is we're actually doing this on a 30 micron scanner. And so if you go back and, and figure it all out, we're getting about 22-bit behavior out of our DAX. Um, and the nice thing there is that you can have a scanner that, that's fairly large, so you can hunt down things uh, and, and zoom in on them, but you also have this, this very low noise floor. So probably one of the most important quantities that you can measure with AFM is something that we call DC height noise at Asylum, and uh, all manufacturers have something that's sort of similar. At Asylum, the way we measure it is you just take a cantilever, you, you calibrate the, the sensitivity of the optical lever, and then you simply park the cantilever on the surface and, and turn the feedback off, and you sit there and watch. And in an ideal world, you'd get no motion whatsoever, but you actually get motion because of, say, voltage, on, voltage noise on the z-axis, uh, vibrational noise in the environment getting through. And, and that extra noise basically determines, you know, what's the smallest height feature that you can resolve. And most AFMs uh, are in the 30 to 40 picometer range. Uh, the Cypher specs 15, and in fact, in reasonable lab environments, we're getting numbers that are more like five picometers. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about AC detector noise, which is actually the, the optical lever noise, which again, you need to make lower to take advantage of these smaller cantilevers. So just to sort of visualize this stuff, because the interesting thing is, you know, a factor of four is, is really a pretty big deal, but but when you're talking about numbers, sometimes it's hard to visualize the difference between 50 picometers and 200. But, you know, if you think about real world situations, a factor of four is a lot. You know, imagine that your body mass is different by a factor of four. Your salary is lower by a factor of four. You know, the, the speed limit's a factor of four different. And, and so these are, you know, these things have very real consequences. And, and one way to visualize this is just to do a little thought experiment for what would happen if we had a four nanometer circle. Um, and we wanted to image it, and we did it with 50 picometers of XY noise. I'd get the circle in the middle, and if you did it with 200 picometers of XY noise, which is typical of a lot of the, uh, the other AFMs out there, you'd see that it's actually compromised the, the circle a lot. And if we take a look at a couple samples, on the left is bacteria rhodopsin, so this is a, a protein sample, and it sort of has length scales in it that are typical of those that you find in molecular biology. And you can see its size is about on that, that four nanometer scale. And so with closed loop, we can actually image samples down at this size very nicely with our noise levels. On the right here are some atoms actually taken in open loop. And you can see that there the length scales are such that even that 50 picometers of noise um, is going to make a difference. We can actually resolve atoms with the, uh, with the closed loop on. But, but if you really want to push the instrument, you still want to turn this off. So another way to... To, to visualize noise in the instrument is to uh, to think about what this height noise means. And so this is actually, this isn't real data. This is this is actually just some model data where I put in a three angstrom step, but I just said, you know, what if that height noise is 30 to 40 picometers instead of 10 picometers, then you can actually see, oh, I see I have an error here. The 10 picometers is actually the one on the left and the 35 is the one on the right. But, but at 35 picometers, you can see that you can still resolve the steps, but they're quite a bit noisier at 10 picometers, you're resolving the steps with a lot higher fidelity. So again, this factor of three or four is a lot when you're down at the angstrom scale. Um, finally, I'm talking about the, the optical lever noise. And so as we lower the thermal noise, which we saw happens with these small cantilevers, 
one thing you want to make sure is that you also lower your instrumental noise floors to make sure that thermal noise is still your dominant noise source. And uh, we actually use an RF modulation technique that was perfected by uh, Takeshi Fukuma, who's now a professor at Kanazawa. And doing this, we can achieve noise floors that are down around 10 femtometers per root hertz. So this is actually one of these very small cantilevers in air. It's almost 4 megahertz. It's pretty stiff. It's about 50 newtons per meter. But you can see that the thermal noise still sticks out of the noise floor by something like a factor of six. And, and so by getting this noise floor down, we make sure that we can take advantage of these smaller cantilevers. And when you think about this number, it's pretty amazing, you know, because this basically says that if you could average for a second, your resolution goes into the femtometer range. And, and a femtometer is now a size that's typical of a nucleus rather than an atom. And, and again, remember, you know, these factors of a thousand are real. You know, I think the analogy is if, if an atom is a baseball stadium, then the nucleus is the size of a baseball. So, so this is actually a pretty amazing noise floor. So let's put those two things together, the, the smaller cantilevers and the instrumental improvements, and, and take a look at what we can do. Um, so one place where you're always thermally limited is magnetic force microscopy measurements. And that's because people are typically working um, in air and with levers that are, are fairly sort of medium soft, sort of a few newtons per meter. And so this was an example that we did um, in collaboration with uh, Lyubov Belova, who's at the, the KTH in, in Stockholm. And what we did is we took a traditional tapping mode, or MFM lever rather, um, which is 240 microns long, has a resonant frequency of about 70 kilohertz, a, a spring constant of about two newtons per meter. And we took one of these small cantilevers, which is five to 10, mi five microns wide, 10 microns long, sort of similar spring constant, but up at 2.1 megahertz. And what Luba did is actually grow in a fib, she grew cobalt tips on the end of, end of these. And the nice thing here is that you can actually grow a tip that has exactly the same magnetic volume and very similar magnetic moments, so you can make direct comparisons. And we went and measured MFM on a, this is a modern hard drive, so this is a, a hard drive we, we bought within the last year, that's two terabytes uh, perpendicular recording media. And we, we imaged this under the same conditions with both these cantilevers, and you can actually see the improvement in signal noise. If you look at some of these bit transitions here on the right, we're resolving them with the small cantilever, but they're blurred out with the big cantilever. So this is something where that, that, uh, that factor of three and, and three to four in thermal noise just, just comes in immediately and helps. Now, we're not going to be talking much about this today, but one of the other benefits that these small cantilevers have is that they're much, much faster. Um, a traditional cantilever in air has something on the order of a kilohertz of bandwidth when you run at resonance. These are more like 10. And so another nice thing is that you can you can image much, much faster. So this is that same hard drive imaged in, in lift mode or, or nap mode, and that's done at a 20 hertz scan rate. So, so it also speeds things up by quite a bit. So an, another place that that is actually becoming very important on the industrial side, we actually get a lot of customers approaching us to, to look at this, is nano roughness. Um, and by that I mean roughness below the nanometer scale. Um, and one of the places it's important is actually in data storage. So that hard drive I just showed you, um, when that's in when that's in the hard drive, the, the hard drive head, which measures that magnetic information, is actually flying just a couple of nanometers above the surface. And so you actually need the surface very smooth. You don't, you don't want to have mountains sticking up that the head runs into. And so they're now polishing this down to the one angstrom level. So if uh, we go back and look at that disk in topography mode rather than MFM mode, I'm going to see um, an RA that's about an angstrom. And that's actually pretty amazing when you think about it, that there's, there's manufacturing lines that are pushing out these disks that are polished to the atomic scale. Um, it ends up the semiconductor guys care even more. So it ends up when you're building transistors on silicon, you, you typically grow an oxide layer to, to, to make the gate oxide. And it ends up that the roughness of that interface actually dictates the, the noise in the transistors and smoother interfaces are better. And so they're, they're pushing well below an angstrom of roughness. And we're actually going to take an we're going to take a look at an example. Um, this is actually a, a standard chemically mechanically polished silicon wafer, a one micron scan, and you can see the roughness is actually down at 1.4 angstrom. So that's already pretty smooth, but but not smooth enough for some applications. And so this is a sample that was given us given to us by a, a Japanese customer um, out of the Omi lab at Tohoku University. 
And this is the silicon, but it's been annealed in argon. And when you anneal it, you can actually see the step structure reappear on the silicon, and things get quite a bit smoother. If I just take this step and I plane fit the image so that I'm only looking at that step, the roughness that the, the instrument measures is now 0.4 angstroms. And so one thing you might ask yourself is, okay, I see that 0.4 angstroms, but I also know that a lot of AFMs have noise floors that are down at 0.4 angstroms or 40 picometers. How do I know that actually means something? And, and so this is a roughness challenge sample we came up with. And, and one thing to be careful with when, when uh, people are talking to you about AFM roughness is that one way to make the roughness go down in an AFM image is, is to turn down the gains. And, you know, at that point, you're no longer tracking the surface. You're not really reporting the roughness. Um, and so just looking at things like mica can be sort of hard because your gain settings uh, can make a difference in the roughness. So for a challenge sample, we actually came up with, with a sample that has a step in it. And the nice thing here is that by imaging the step, your gains have to be set at a reasonable number. And so you'll know that you're sort of in a normal imaging configuration. And what we ended up choosing is molybdenum disulfide. So it's a uh, something that looks a lot like graphite, it cleaves very nicely. But one of the problems with, with HOPG, um, the graphite samples, is you tend to get rolling hill backgrounds. So it's hard to find an area that's flat enough to, to get in there and measure the roughness. Um, MOS2, if you look around, you can actually find individual steps. And so this step shown in the image on the left is, is six angstroms from here to here. Um, this is taken with one of these sort of medium-sized cantilevers. And once you find that step, you can take an image and then we can go in and actually analyze the, the, the roughness on one of the terraces. And in this case, now I've, I've zoomed in on that height scale. So this is now a two angstrom full scale um, image. And over here, I've histogrammed the, the height data. And if you actually measure the RA, the apparent RA here is below 10 picometers. So with Cypher and these smaller cantilevers, we often see numbers that are eight to 10 picometers. And if you look here, there's actually a tiny bit of structure here. So, so even this, this eight to 10 picometers is still probably a combination of instrument noise plus something that's a little bit real. But, but the nice thing is, you know, if you're looking at 40 picometer roughnesses, if you can see the instrument returning numbers that are below 10 picometers, that validates that 40 picometers. If you have an instrument where the noise is 30 or 40 picometers, you measure a roughness that's 30 or 40 picometers, you can't really say much about what's going on with the sample. And so this is nice. You know, if this is something you're interested in, you know, rather than looking at specs, one thing you can do is just, just ask people to, to demonstrate this same sample. So moving on uh, to something different, this is some, some imaging at the atomic scale, and, and we're doing this on calcite crystals. So in the upper right, I've, I've shown you what a calcite crystal looks like at the macroscopic scale. They, they sort of look like ice cubes, but calcite's a calcium carbonate. It's a, it's a really common mineral, and, and you can just go out into the ground and dig up these crystals. In fact, you can find crystals that are meters across, and uh, this is also the same stuff that appears on your bathtub walls. But, but these big crystals that you find are birefringent. You can actually see that looking at the image of the ruler, you see those two images. So, so they're very useful in optics, but a nice property they have is that they're cleavable. So you can hit this with a razor blade and you can make a surface that's pretty atomically flat. And the other thing that's nice is that they're slightly soluble. It's just about 50 parts per million, which is uh, why it's so bad in your bathtub. But the nice thing for an AFM sample is that it's self-cleaning. So if you cleave this and you put it in water, the crystal slowly dissolves. And it dissolves slowly enough that it doesn't really bother your AFM imaging but it means that it's exposing new atomic layers and, and giving you fresh surfaces. And so this is a sample, uh, or this is an image rather, of terraces at atomic resolution that's taken with one of these small cantilevers at, at small amplitudes and liquids. And one of the nice things you can see is, is if you sight down these rows, so I, I put a line there to help you, when you go up a terrace, you can actually see the stacking. Right, so the high point on this low terrace actually corresponds to the rows on the terrace above it. And if we go in and take a look at what the atomic structure of, of calcite looks like, uh, this will all make sense. And so this is uh, what calcite looks like looking at the cleavage plane from the side. Um, and so calcite would be, a, it's an ionic crystal, um, and it would be a simple crystal, you know, it would be something like sodium chloride except for the fact that instead of just atoms, one of the members is actually a small molecule. So in green, we have the calciums, 
and in in gray and red we have the carbonates and the carbonates are are a small molecule with three spokes you can think of it like a bicycle wheel and the fact that you have to pack these into the crystal makes the structure a little more complicated than something like sodium chloride but you still have these alternating rows of, of positive and negative charges and you can see that the carbonates sit in the crystal at a 45 degree angle and over here looking down again from the side of the cleavage plane but from the other axis you can actually see that we see six spokes and the reason is when you sight down that axis every other carbonate is actually twisted differently um, but if I put this line here this stacking is actually what we were seeing in the previous image when you go up a terrace then you uh, you go from being on a calcium to a carbonate and that was actually clear in the previous image so if we look down on the cleavage plane, so this is now what the, the AFM tip sees, you can see this, again, what would be a fairly simple lattice except for these carbonates. So this is four by five angstroms, and that would be the unit cell, except as we walk along this axis, you can actually see that the carbonates are twisting back and forth, like I said. So that actually makes the unit cell eight by five angstroms, because you have to include two of these carbonates to get through there. But if we ask ourselves, you know, what we might see with the AFM, these are the oxygen atoms and these are what stick up the highest and so we might expect to see oxygen atoms and if we were seeing that we'd expect to see some zigzag in the rows in XY and we'd expect to see all these rows at the same height and so here's an image um, calcite this is actually some iron rich calcite um, and the interesting thing here is is that when we started looking at this we realized that we could see point defects. And there's been some point defect in, in liquid and air resolution in AFM, but for the most part, it's, it's been in UHV. And so this was something that was very exciting. I think these are the, the clearest point defects that have ever been seen in, in air or in liquid. But there's a couple of interesting features here. One is that you sort of see this every other row appearance as you go down some of these images. And that's something that we don't expect based on that oxygen structure that I just told you about. We expect all those oxygens to be at the same Z level. But if you just look here, you can see there's a little drift between the images, but if you just let your eye sort of follow these defects, you can see that, that they repeat in both images. And so if we zoom in, we can see these defects a little more clearly. So we see things that actually look like, like single vacancies and at other times we see things that look like ad atoms sitting on top of the lattice and so so one question you know one question is where's the contrast coming from it didn't look like it was consistent with uh, just imaging the upper oxygens but from some work i did in in grad school um, we actually know that the calcite crystal is, is strongly hydrated so if you just take a an afm cantilever of a few newtons per meter and you park it close to the surface and you look at the thermal noise, the cantilever actually jumps up and down. So this is a two angstrom scale bar. And if you look at a force curve, you can take this jumping and you can turn it into a, a probability plot. So this is just a simple force curve here. But what I've done is I've colored the, the image according to the probability of finding the cantilever at a certain location. And you can clearly see that there's a couple layers above the surface. And so your picture for this should be that, that at the hard crystal boundary, as the waters start stacking up, the first couple layers end up having to be ordered simply by the presence of its wall. But one thing I never understood is that these layers ended up being on the order of an angstrom, right? Angstrom to an angstrom and a half, if you look at that spacing. And, and that didn't make a lot of sense because a water molecule is bigger than that. But it ends up that uh, a lot of geologists are still studying the calcite water interface because it's calcite's a pretty important uh, mineral in a lot of geological systems for example in pH in, in groundwater it's important and so this is actually some x-ray data um, from a surface technique and so what we're seeing on the left here is the electron density and I've tipped it sideways so I can line it up with what's on the right which is actually a molecular dynamics simulation of the of the calcite water interface and you can see that the x-ray data shows that if I look at this bottom layer of the of the sample here you can actually see the electron density from the, the calciums and the carbons and, and also the oxygens above. If I move up to the last layer of the crystal, I can see there's some relaxation. These peaks get a little bit broader and the molecular dynamics guys say that they expect the carbonates to, to start twisting a little bit and you can see that. But then right above here in the electron density data, there's two peaks before you get into the bulk water and the molecular dynamics guys agree that, that there should be ordered water that are 
the first two layers of the water should be strongly ordered. And what's interesting is they also think that the water should be offset. And this explains that sort of angstrom scale, uh, the angstrom scale jumps that we saw in the force curves. The waters aren't directly on top of each other, so you can actually see layering at, at something that's less than a water molecule. And so if we look at what that looks like from the top, here's the calcite lattice, again, looking down on the cleavage plane, and in the green and the blue is where they expect the waters to be. So you can see that one layer coordinates with the calciums, and the next layer up is, is coordinated with the carbonates more closely. And so with that in mind, we went back and looked, and, and one thing we see a lot is that the contrast changes uh, why we're imaging. So this is a height image and we did nothing. There's no change in the set point and just during the course of the image the height and the phase changed a lot. And if we actually go back and look at what the apparent height did during this this region where the phase contrast changed a lot, it actually looks like the height the crystal appeared to grow about an angstrom. Now in reality what we think happened here is the cantilever jumped up to the next hydration layer about an angstrom higher and suddenly the contrast changed. And so we think we're actually imaging in those hydration layers. And then the point defects become interesting because probably what's happening is, is in that iron-rich calcite. So you can get iron substitutions. Those defects are probably templating disorder and defects in the hydration layers. So I suspect that those point defects that we're seeing are actually in the hydration layers, but, but they're templated by the, the defects in the underlying crystal. So changing gears again a little bit. Uh, Moving on to some, some biology samples, we're going to look at bacteria rhodopsin. So this is actually a, a membrane protein that's found in, in single cell organisms called halobacteria. And its job in life is, is actually to pump protons across the cell membrane. So it, it sits in the cell membrane, and when it absorbs a photon, it can pump a proton across this cell membrane. And the nice thing about it for AFM is that in the cell membrane, it actually forms these 2D crystalline patches that end up covering a lot of the cell. And so you can isolate this, and, and when you spread this down on a surface like mica, you actually end up with, with a thin layer with a nice 2D crystal in it. And it's actually been studied a lot by AFM, and so it makes a great protein reference sample because you can go into the literature and, and see what the best results are. And so here's an example of Again, very small amplitude uh, tapping in liquid. This is something like, I think, a four angstrom amplitude. And the, the actual height data is up here. And so even in that data, we can very clearly see uh, point defects. If you start looking, there's places where this is missing. But we can also apply this, this technique that's fairly common and, and comes from electron microscopy called correlation averaging, where it's it's something like Fourier averaging, except for a lot of these biological crystals, the, the lattice isn't so well defined that Fourier averaging works. And so you basically go around and, and just find unit cells, line them up with other unit cells, and, and average them. And you can see in the average data, we have very high resolution. And if you look at the power spectrum from, from the AFM data, that's another way to measure resolution. And you can actually see, you can see these spots that correspond to the lattice. And there's a 10 angstrom line I've drawn and then a 6 angstrom line outside it. And you can see that the dots extend well beyond the 10 angstrom line out to the 6, ang the six angstrom line in, in some places. And so from this, we can infer that we're actually getting 6 angstrom resolution, which compares very favorably with, with what's in the literature. And so if we compare a little bit with previous results, so uh, Simon Schuring is, is a guy that studied a lot of BR uh, starting in, in, in Engel's lab. And so some results on the right here are from a 2002 paper. And there he found, this was done in contact mode, he found that when he imaged at low force, he just saw the three subunits. But at higher force, around 200 piconewtons, there was actually a conformational change. And suddenly he could see three units of three. And so one thing that's nice here is that this is sort of a biological force sensor, right? We can tell if we're imaging with low force if we just see the, the three subunits. If we go to higher forces, which we generally don't want to do, we'll see this conformational change. And, and if we look at our correlation average, we can see that we're seeing just the three subunits. And so from that, we can actually infer that we're applying forces that are 100 piconewtons or less. You know, in reality, we actually think they're, they're quite a bit smaller than that, down probably at the 10 piconewton level. Um, sort of one interesting anecdote here is that a little over a year ago, one of our competitors uh, gave a webinar and showed some VR data. And, and they also compared to, to Simon's results. But 
somewhere along the line, this one nanometer scale bar became a 10 nanometer scale bar. And I actually think this, you know, it was just somebody mixing up angstrom to nanometers, but uh, they then used that 10 nanometer scale bar to, to uh, draw a lot of conclusions about how their data was a few times better than, than Simon's, but in reality, it was a few times worse. So it ends up, one way you can make your instrument look good is to make the historical data look 10 times worse. Uh, we sort of like building better instruments, but that's just us. And so we can also look at dynamics. And so this is actually a movie taken on, on BR, again, small cantilevers, small amplitudes. And what's nice here, uh, this isn't amazingly fast. It's, I think, about a minute per image. But you can see these point defects jumping around. And you can see them move and, and disappear and reappear. And what's really interesting is if you look at these clouds that are moving around, um, you can actually see structure in the clouds. So if you look at those white areas that are bouncing around, Within those areas, you actually see high spots that correspond to the lattice underneath. And so we actually think this is loose BR that, that's moving around on the top of the membrane. And a nice thing, you know, imaging BR just in the, in the lattice itself is hard enough. But here we're actually getting molecular resolution on loosely bound BR that's, that's moving around on the top of the lattice. And so this is something that definitely shows off how low force this, this imaging technique is. And the other nice thing is that this is fairly routine. So imaging BR in contact mode, like I said, you're often chasing the set point. We find in, in AC mode, things are a lot easier. You, you pick your set point and, and you don't have to play around with it a lot. But, but this is a, a really nice result. If you actually sit, sit here and stare at this for a while, it even looks like it's, it's possible that as these clouds move over and, and more defects appear, that, that the clouds get a little bigger and a little smaller. So I think with a little more work, you actually might be able to, to correlate the, you know, the clouds and the defects. And so uh, moving on to the last result, so uh, we're taking a look at what is you know, really probably the classic molecule in molecular biology, which is the, the DNA double helix. And, and just to sort of remind people of, of what the structure is, um, it's, it's, it looks like a spiral staircase. The periodicity is, is about 34 angstroms, although that actually comes from from x-ray data of DNA fibers. And, and one interesting thing was I just sort of poked around the literature and I realized people are still arguing a little bit about what this looks like in, in liquid when the DNA is, is totally loose. And I mean, the arguments are small. It's an angstrom here, you know, an angstrom there. But, but it's important to remember that this structure does come from x-ray data. And if the, if the sort of staircases of the, of the spiral staircase went straight across, then the, the stairs would be flat and you'd actually expect to see a, the staircase be, e be evenly spaced. In reality, the, the the sides of the staircase aren't symmetric. And so as you go down the, the double helix, you actually see what's called the major groove and the minor groove because of this. And the major groove is about 22 angstrom, the minor is about 12, and, and they add up to give you the total periodicity. And there's been some previous uh, double helix results. Uh, Helen Hansman's group at UCSB got got some glimpses of, of what looked like double helix resolution in propanol, and probably I think the nicest results in the, in the previous literature are from Zhifeng Shao's group where, where he actually prepared some bilayer samples and, and bound the DNA to it. And so this is a, an example of, of again, you know, small amplitude, uh, small cantilever results. And on the left is the height image, and on the right is the phase image. And, and these are 75 by 150 nanometers. And what's interesting, here is in height, we can actually see, you can definitely see what looks like beads on a string, right? So you can see periodicity there. Um, but in phase, it's really striking that, that in certain directions, we see just striking periodicity. And if we take a line section down that and I look at the phase, I put lines on the graph that are spaced 36 angstroms apart to guide your eye. You can see there's very nice periodicity. And there's even structure occurring in the middle, which, which could be due to the minor groove. In height, it's not as clear. That's the same section. And, and so one interesting thing we see is, is depending on the tip, sometimes we get better resolution in height, sometimes we get better resolution in phase. In this particular instance, I suspect that the tip shape was such that, that it fit into the, into the grooves along a certain direction, and, and that changed the dissipation. And that's why we're getting such nice contrast in phase. But, but the important thing is we're seeing this fairly regularly, and the periodicities are always what we expect within a few angstroms. And then the last result is, is, is a result which is actually on AP mica. I should have mentioned the, the previous one was actually done in a, in a nickel buffer. And, and one, of, one of the nice things here is that on AP mica, 
we're actually imaging simply in TRIS, so we're back in a, in a physio physiological buffer. Uh, some people worry that the, the divalent cations that, that are part of the normal DNA prep you know, aren't physiological and, and are going to cause problems for some experiments. This is now a, a physiological environment, and here you can see that the situation is swapped. In height, you can very clearly see the, the helix periodicity. And if we run down a line, there's probably too much DNA on this sample and that it's lying on top of itself. But as we run down this line, the height goes up hills and down hills. But again, I put these blue lines on the graph at 35 angstroms to, to guide your eye. You can see there's very clear periodicity there and it's right at the level that we expect. And, and in phase, you can see the periodicity, but it's not as clear. And so with these things, you know, tip shape all the way down to the atomic scale matters. And, and we think that's some of what's driving this resolution appearing in in height mode uh, versus the, the phase. So, so to wrap up here, I, I hope I've convinced you that the, the smaller cantilevers improve your thermal noise limit and that when you combine those with instrumental improvements, the entire instrument performance improves again by, by something like I think a, a factor of three to five. And, and again, with this stuff, uh, you know, looking at numbers is one thing, but, but the reason that we're so data-centric at Asylum is one easy way to, to compare AFMs is, is simply take a look at the data. And uh, this is just uh, where you can actually see it for yourself. We're going to be at the Biophysical Society meeting uh, next week and also at APS. So if you want to see the instrument, come by and take a look. So that concludes the, the presentation part. Um, Roger Prooks, who's another co-founder and, and president of Asylum, has been sorting through some questions, and so we're gonna we're gonna run through some of these questions, and uh, you can hang around and, and listen to them. Or uh, if you're leaving, if you're leaving us, uh, thanks for being with us. Thanks very much, Jason. Uh, the first question is about uh, the drag coefficient. Is B the drag coefficient easy to estimate from cantilever parameters? So could I look at a cantilever and predict the noise levels? Yeah, so it ends up there. The, the, the easiest way to do that is, is just to take the thermal noise, fit it with that simple harmonic oscillator response, and, and from those parameters that you can measure from the thermal noise, the, the B drops right out. And once you have that B, you can, we, you can run through those equations and, and directly estimate what those input force noise values are. OK. Um, Next question, can I use small cantilevers in any AFM? So, the, as I said, the, there's sort of medium-sized cantilevers and, and small-sized cantilevers. And so most AFMs, the spot size ends up being something on the order of, of 40 microns and for, for standard AFMs. And so some of the middle middle sized ones can sort of fit on a on a standard AFM, but just barely. But but for the smaller middle ones and and the very small ones, you do need a specialized AFM. And so uh, Cipher is one of those, and uh, we're actually happy to see that some other uh, competitors out there have, have jumped on the bandwagon. And and so there are some other instruments out there now that can do that as well. Um. Okay, next question. Why is noise higher in liquid? If noise is higher, shouldn't the atoms look even better in air? Why are there no single, uh, why haven't you shown any single atomic defects in air? Yeah, that's actually a, that's a really good question. And, and it ends up that it's true. The, the force, the, in, the equivalent input noise is smaller in air, but the big problem in air is just that surfaces are always coated with a, a layer of water, or if they're hydrophobic, probably a layer of oil from, from from contaminants in the air, and that makes it very small to run, or makes it very hard to run at these very small amplitudes. So the noise levels are there, but but the physics is against you in air. Okay, uh, next question. You showed 14 femtometers if you average for a second, uh, but that's not the whole story. Drift will affect the measurements over a second. What is the real limit when drift is included? Yeah, that's actually a really good question, and it, and it is important to, to realize that, you know, uh, from a mathematical standpoint, you can always make things quieter by just averaging more and more. But but if things are moving around, then uh, then what you're averaging is actually a changing signal. And so, you know, your question is really complicated because it depends on what you want to measure, and so it depends on, on what sort of drift you're talking about. And, and so, I think the best thing to do there is just, you know, find something that that's close to what you want to do, like the atoms or the molecular biology stuff, and and take a look at the data. OK, 
Okay. Um, were the MFM images you shown uh, taken in NAP or lift mode or in dual AC mode? So those were all done in, in NAP or lift mode. And, and yeah, the same conditions. So we tried to get exactly the same closest approach distance and, and the, the same imaging parameters. Okay. There's a question now about nano roughness. Uh, do you have a nano roughness standard? Uh, the MOS2 seems to work well. Yeah, and so we actually looked around a little bit. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's harder than you think to find a, a sample that, that has atomic steps in air that's, that's really smooth. For example, the calcite, when you cleave it, you know, over the course of several minutes, the surface starts reconstructing. And so a lot of surfaces, you know, they don't like being exposed like that, and they reconstruct. And so the MOS2 is nice in that it's, it's a low energy surface. It's, it's hydrophobic. And and when you cleave it, it, it stays clean for a while. And, and so that's what we took as a, as a nano roughness standard. And that's just something we adopted, but, but I think it would probably make a pretty good, uh, pretty good standard. We've also fooled around some with, uh, with things like steps on Sapphire there, since the, the samples aren't cleavable, cleaning them gets to be a real challenge. So yeah, I think MOS2 is a, is a nice standard. Okay. Uh, how do you calibrate Z? Can you expect accuracy down to one angstrom, as in your ordered water example? Yeah, so the the Z sensor we actually calibrate at the factory with a with an interferometer, and if you actually look at the the nonlinearities, the the numbers are pretty amazingly small, something like a, a tenth of a percent or or smaller. And so, yeah, I think you can expect accuracy down to sub angstrom, and and if that's something that you really care about, for example, uh, you can look at HF etched mica. That's sort of the God's gift to Z calibration because it ends up the, the steps are 1.001 nanometers tall. And so if that's something you really care about, you can you can take a look at the, the etched mica and make sure you're getting the right answer and then, then move on to the, the measurement that you want to make. Okay, a couple of questions about the bacteria adopsin. Um, could defect motion in the BR come from the tip pushing the molecules around? Yeah, that's entirely possible. And it's one of those things that, uh, that you just have to, you know, look at, look at several of these movies and, and look for effects that, that correlate with tip motion. And, and, you know, another thing you can do is stop imaging for a little bit and, uh, and <laughs> not just screwing around with my mouse. <laughs> you can stop imaging for for a little bit and and see if the defects are still moving. But but you know with all AFM measurements, it's a mechanical measurement, so it's always something that you need to worry about. Okay, um, what was the time per image in the BR? So those were about about a minute per image, so it 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 wasn't uh, blazingly fast. Uh, let's see, uh, can you do fast high temperature imaging? How how about the noise? So uh, the answer is soon. We're actually the the next scanner that we're working on for Cipher, which is which is fairly close to coming out, is actually an environmental scanner. So it's going to have a full flow through control, heating, cooling, gas exchange, all that, and and so that's actually we think that's just a few months away to to making it to market. And noise, you know, for that scanner, we've got prototypes in house. We expect probably similar noise levels. For the last measurement of DNA, you used a 32 kilohertz cantilever and not one of the high frequency ones. Is there any reason? Yeah, so that, that's actually one of the middle size cantilevers and uh, it is actually, so that is a, uh, it's a biolever mini, so it's about uh, 40 microns long. And, and in terms of spring constant, that compares to uh, a seven kilohertz traditional cantilever. And, so in picking these things, some of the medium-sized cantilevers, some of the manufacturers are, are doing a little better job on tip sharpness. And so that Bio Mini is just sort of in a nice sweet spot. Olympus does a really nice job with, with tip sharpness there. And it's, it's small enough that you get a lot of the thermal noise benefits and you get the higher resonant frequency. Um, and you know, it's, we're still pushing on this stuff to, to even smaller cantilevers. But a lot of those very small cantilevers at this point still have EBD tips on them. So they're more expensive and, and there's not as much variety. Okay, uh, let's see here. If we want to use the cantilever for high temperature, uh, example up to 200 C, which cantilever would you suggest? I mean, so 200 is not that high a temperature, so, uh, you know, in that case, I would let, you know, I'd see what you want to image and, and let that drive the cantilever choice. Um, and, and at that temperature, you know, any of the standard cantilevers should work. 
Okay. How do you explain the points observed in the atomic in images? Some of them disappear after the second scan. Yeah, if you watch that stuff carefully, what's what's interesting is the you know if you if you look at movies of that stuff. I only showed a couple images, but wherever there's a defect, there's always a feature of some sort that remains. And and like I said, my picture there is that we're not directly seeing the defects in the crystal. We're seeing the defects. They're templating defects and disorder in the water layer, but that water layer is very active. In fact, uh, you know, probably on the microsecond time scale, water molecules are, are moving in and out of those defect zones. And so I think that's one of the reasons that these things don't look quite as stable as, as point defects like we're used to from UHV. Okay. This is related to an earlier question, but I have an MFP 3D AFM. What is the smallest tip I can use? So the, the 3D can, can reach into a lot of those sort of middle size cantilevers. Um, definitely 60 micron cantilevers are fine. 40 starts to be pushing it, but, but you can use them with a little bit of loss of some. Okay. Um, so let me see if I understand this. How and to what extent can we depend on the measured K, the measured spring constant of small cantilevers uh, using the MFP software? So it's, we haven't seen, uh, much of a difference there. So, you know, I generally tell people that unless you're very careful, you should believe the thermal spring constants to sort of plus or minus 20%. Um, and I think with the small cantilevers, the, the answer is basically the same. Okay. What is the radius of the AFM tip that you use? Yeah, that's a hard question, actually. And and really, you know, the only way to directly measure it that, that I know of on the on the length scales that we care about is is to either infer it from the AFM image or do something like uh, TEM. But but you know for for a lot of the imaging that I showed here, what really matters isn't the, the total radius, but really what the sort of nano roughness of the tip looks like. And for some of this stuff, I think uh, you know given the the resolution we're getting, there must be an atom at the end that's sticking out a little bit farther. So for some of it, the relevant radius is probably an atom atomic radius and and for other stuff, it's it's bigger, but like with the bio minis, that's the same Olympus tip process, and they aim to sort of have 10 nanometer radiuses at the at the end of the cantilever. Okay, is it true that small cantilevers are very expensive? So the very smallest ones still are. Um, the medium sized ones have gotten uh, a lot more uh, reasonable, and and small cantilevers that are are affordable is something that we're working on at Asylum, and, and we expect some, some stuff making it to market very quickly. Okay, this is a question about calibration. How stable is the calibration, and how often has it to be repeated? So this is something where we have instruments come back after, after a few years in the field, and the LVDTs, which are what we use for, um, for the sensors, are actually incredibly stable. We've had instruments come back after being in the, in the field for three or four years, and the, the sensitivity when we measure it with the interferometer is only changed by 0.1 or 0.2 percent. So pretty small. Yeah. Uh, what is the fastest you have imaged with Cypher? Uh, so we've done line rates of, of up to 80 hertz, and, and so then you know, your frame rates depend on, on how many lines, but there's some DNA examples on the web that are a frame per second or, or even a little faster. Okay. Um, Regarding DNA, can you resolve periodicity on DNA with isolated molecules, or do you need some close packing? It's actually a good question, Neil. And the the best results we've seen are on things that look like they're they're somewhat close packed. And and with this stuff, we're finding holding the DNA down at the atomic scale is is very important. Uh, for a lot of the DNA preps, it's fine for sort of imaging at the one micron scale, but but holding it down to, to keep it atomically still is the challenge, and that's something that we're still working on. But but right now, definitely the best uh, periodicity examples are on, on things that look a little more close packed. Okay, this is a, an historical question. <laughs> the concept of using small cantilevers has been recognized long ago. What are the key technological advances which makes it happen just now? That's, I mean, that's a really good question, and it's, it's one of those things that I actually asked it to myself. You know, this was something that, that, as I said, several of us worked on in grad school 15 years ago. Why did it take so long? And, I mean, one interesting thing about the FM field is that historically different people made the cantilevers in the instruments. And so one thing was there was this chicken and the egg problem. You know, when we started working on Cypher many years ago, we went to the AFM cantilever manufacturers and said, you know, we want small cantilevers. And they said, well, there's no market. There's no instruments. And, and so uh, 
you know, why should we work on them? And and so that sort of became a, a problem. And and in the end, we just forged ahead, and it ended up there were sort of these medium-sized cantilevers. And, and now that people see the benefits, the a lot of the cantilever manufacturers are working on small cantilevers. So it's just it's you know commercializing stuff always takes longer than than I would expect. Okay. Uh, do you have some interesting applications of small levers and cipher in force spectroscopy? I don't have them here. I think there might be one result on the web, but it's it's interesting. So we've found uh, you definitely expect those thermal noise benefits down at at low frequencies as well, and and indeed the bio mini is is a very quiet cantilever. There's some interesting effects that there's actually some literature papers on this. When you get to very small sizes. Um, it actually ends up that there's one of our F noise in the cantilevers that people think, and we agree, actually comes from the coatings on the cantilever. And so the very smallest cantilevers, um, you don't quite get what you'd expect in terms of noise benefits. Okay. Uh, can the changing forces over a point defect be used to infer whether the defect is a vacancy or a substitution or something else? Or does the hydration layer prevent this? Yeah, that's that's a good question, and we've it's something we need to fool around with a little bit more. And uh, you know, now that we sort of have this theory, we can you know we're trying to start to assign contrast based on on the layers that we think we're in. But but one question is whether you can uh, you know whether you have enough force that you can knock all the water out of the way and even get to the crystal. Um, that's not clear to me. So it's my current guess is that it feels like we're always imaging up a hydration layer, and so in that case, it's it's probably pretty hard to say what the the real defect is in the underlying crystal. So uh, one final question here: If we can resolve the helix, can we use this to sequence DNA? Uh, so that's that's been a dream of of people for a long time, and it ends up that the you've got about another factor of ten to go. So the there's about 10 base pairs per helix pip, so we're getting close, but but it's also hard because the, the base pairs are sort of locked up inside the inside the helix, so you have to go to probably single-stranded DNA, and it's it's something people have worked on a long time, and I actually think uh, there's actually some pretty amazing sequencing technologies that are, are based on um, optical methods now that, that you know, have... Have, have taken off, and I'd be, you know, never predict the future, but I'd be surprised if, if sequencing by, by AFM ever ends up being important. Okay, I think that's it for the questions. Uh, if you missed any portion of this webinar, you can view the archive version uh, later on using the same link you just used to log in. All right, thanks everybody.